Okay, we'll get going. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad to have you with us um, to talk about one of our favorite topics, which is thriving in the University of Texas College Admissions process. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, obviously, we'll be sharing this recording with everyone, and we'll also um, share um, this presentation and our guide to college admissions at UT Austin. Um, also, one other housekeeping note, if you can, please use the Q&A box for questions. Um, it makes it easier for our team to follow and respond. If it's a question that applies to everybody, we'll definitely try to answer it. But generally speaking on webinars like this, sometimes it becomes so specific to a family that it's awfully hard to answer without knowing more about the students. So we may very well say, hey, that'd be a great conversation to have with the folks at UT. Um, um, welcome from our team. Um, we're lucky we have a team of consultants and counselors across Texas and across the country, and four of us are with you today. Um, uh, we are folks who work with kids who apply to UT every day. Um, we've been working with um, kids applying to UT since College Match Point was started. The majority of them are not auto-admit kids and they are often applying to competitive majors. Um, and um, it is an absolute joy for us to um, run into students or talk to them uh, while they're on the 40 acres or once they've graduated from UT. Um, we're not here to sell you UT, but we are so excited about such a spectacular school that so many kids who we work with apply to. Um, a little information that sometimes can be helpful, particularly if you're a parent or a student going through this process for the first time. Uh, the most recent admit rate for UT overall dropped below 30% for the first time in the school's history, okay? So um, the secret is out nationally on UT as such an attractive school and such a great option um, 75% of the admitted class was in the top 6%. And so that's an important thing always to understand. There are some families and students on this Zoom who are 9th, 10th, or 11th graders, and they frequently ask us, what's the most important thing I can do to help my chances at UT? And the answer is, obviously, do really well in the most rigorous classes you can take, okay? Simple for adults to say that, hard for a student to do that. And if you're a senior looking at going from here to applications, just understand top 6% makes up 75% of the admitted class. And there's a lot of competition for that other section of the admitted class. UT has always had a commitment to first generation, but I think it's fair to say over the last several years, they've really stepped up their efforts to admit a class that looks more like Texas, the state of Texas, um, both in terms of first generation and in terms of um, uh, diversity of student base. Um, it's also important to understand as a student, what are some of the most common majors selected at UT? Um, the School of Natural Sciences, always remember computer science is in the School of Natural Sciences at UT. Liberal Arts, Engineering, the Cockrell School, incredible. Business, Macombs, equally as incredible. And then the Communication School, which is really on the rise. The Moody School has a whole host of programs. Um, for folks in the great state of Texas, you'll be reminded that the Texas legislature is very conscious of capping the out-of-state and international students that can be admitted to UT. Those of you that happen to be outside of the state of Texas understand that while UT doesn't report out-of-state admissions rates, it is anecdotally substantially lower than the overall 29% admit rate last year. And then finally, and, I, and we always try to stress this with families and students, and just bookmark this when we get to resume, UT shares a little bit of the profile of some of the students that are admitted to the school. 
Um, more than 6,100 students participated in some form of employment or internship. I mean, honestly, if you're a ninth or 10th grader, one of the greatest things to do, get a job, maybe in the area you think you're gonna major in. Um, students are, uh, uh, students admitted to UT are recognized as exceptional students, either on a state, national, or even international level. They don't just take the initiative, they're recognized for their excellence. Um, UT puts an emphasis on both formal and informal leadership. More than 4,500 students have served as a president of an activity or an organization. And then this is the one that uh, certainly as an adult surprises me compared to when I was a teenager. More than 1,600 students who were uh, admitted in the class founded a company, a nonprofit, or a school institution. This is a snapshot of the most recent class. It's obviously not in deep detail, but we hope this gives you a little perspective to sort of um, position what does it look like on the UT side. Lisa, could you um, talk a bit about the process that UT uses to review all their applicants? Sure, and I'm going to take a quick minute to introduce our team so you know who we have with us, so you know the backgrounds. My name is Lisa Carlton. I'm the founder of College Matchpoint. Bob Carlton is a co-founder, and then we have Claudia Salinas with us. Claudia does come from the admission side of the table, so she's worked at highly selective colleges around the country, including Cornell, Harvey Mudd, University of Rochester. So, and then Allison Randall is with us. She is a UT um, graduate and a Plan Two graduate, and is over all of our essay process and oversees our kind of all of our student work. So, just so you have a little bit of background of our team, I think that helps before we jump in here and talk about the holistic review. So when I say holistic review, Claudia, will you kind of give your kind of example as a person who's been an admissions officer, what holistic review means? So holistic review means everything is reviewed. Every part of the application is taken into consideration. And so I think a lot of times families feel like, oh, they're just really concerned about grades and test scores. But we know that students are much deeper than that. So everything starts to come into play in terms of activities and essays, demonstrated interests, which we'll get to at some point, and the resume, which includes all of those wonderful activities. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so as Claudia said, many of you, when you think about how am I gonna get in college, you're sort of thinking here on grades and test scores. The first thing I would say about UT is grades are a lot more important than test scores. Even pre-pandemic, UT was not terribly focused on test scores, except in a few majors, okay? So when we talk about those most competitive majors, you will notice that test scores come into play. The other thing to realize about UT and test scores, they are test optional, and we don't see that hurting students. And we had students get in test optional in almost every major, so that, that certainly is an option. One thing to know is if you're applying into say Moody School of Communications, they're really focusing on the English and reading side of your score more than other schools do. And if you were say applying into electrical engineering, they're very focused on your math score. And there's even a calculus readiness, you have to show that. So they are really looking at your score. You're gonna hear sort of a theme across the night that UT is, really looking at you in light of what major you're applying to. And almost every piece of this puzzle goes back to that. Did you take the courses that line up with that major? Your resume is very important in UT. And I think most parents, when they see what we call a UT resume, they kind of choke because most of us think that a resume should never be longer than two pages. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The essays are a part of this, the major and then demonstrated interest. Demonstrated interest is how you show a college that you're genuinely interested in them. Best way to do that is go do an official visit or do a virtual visit, um, something where you have to sign in. 
I do think UT is tracking interest. I don't think it's like extreme on that, but it certainly isn't going to hurt you. It definitely will help you when we talk about honors programs. One other comment to make in terms of holistic review. We hear when we talk to parents how different it was between when adults applied to college and when kids nowadays are applying to college. If you take a snapshot of UT, this is even different from eight to 10 years ago. This emphasis on holistic, this sense of major being in some ways metaphorically a hook to hang parts of your application on. And then finally demonstrated interest, which is frankly a school's attempt to project how likely is it that if they say yes to a student, the student will say yes back, right? And so understanding this is very different from that carnival ride approach to college admissions, which was you must have this GPA and this test score. And if you do, you're in. UT is very holistic. And remember, if you're applying to a competitive major, they're still holistic if you're in the top 6% because they want to understand the student, not just her numbers. And I think one thing that people always ask us that is interesting is, do they really read all this stuff? Oh my God, yes. I'll jump in right there. I can tell you right now, every single application is read at least twice. Okay. And so this is something that I think a lot of people aren't as aware of on the admissions process because they're like, oh my gosh, how can you possibly read that volume of applications? And I can tell you, it's a lot of late nights. It's plenty of energy drinks and it's eating a nice healthy breakfast in the morning to get you through all of those applications. So it's important that you are uh, putting together a really strong application for yourself because of the volume, you're, all the applications are read, but at the same time, you have just a moment in time to present yourself. So we're going to start diving in a little bit deeper into what all these different pieces are. Right. And so thank you, Claudia. I appreciate that. On terms of testing, I think I really stressed the most important things, which are UT is test optional and you need to determine if your test scores fall in the middle 50 percentile, which is going to be harder to know because it is kind of major dependent. And so when you're starting to go for those more competitive majors, you should expect that you're going to need higher test scores. Um, like, yeah, so I'm definitely like engineering business, those schools. If, you, if you're not a great tester, especially in the part, like if you're not a great math tester, you probably don't want to send those scores, but you can um, choose to be test optional. Now, what I wanna spend some real time talking about, because this is where the rubber meets the road with UT. Fit to major for a student, and I'm with Bob, any of you students that are on here that are younger, this is a great time to really perk your ears up after you got the message that you should get great grades, is while adults may agree or disagree that knowing your major going to college, whether that's important or not, the University of Texas at Austin has decided it is. So if you are bleeding orange and you want to go to UT, you have to know your major. There's no there's a couple of undecided within colleges, but there's no undecided major at UT. And certain majors are more competitive than other majors. Business, engineering, natural sciences, computer science within natural sciences, but also the natural sciences like biology is very competitive, architecture, nursing, and then we see some like economics and psychology have gotten somewhat more competitive and nursing has gotten is very competitive as well. But when we say fit to major, what we mean is when Claudia is pretending to review your application, can she see, is it evident that you were preparing to be a business major? Did you take any business courses? Did you do any summer activities? Do you have, you know, what kinds of things have you done? So you're thinking of your application 
almost like a case for a major. And there is no, this is so important at UT. I cannot stress this enough. And what I see a lot of students doing is, you know, they'll be just doing, oh, what major do you think I should be? That stuff really needs to line up. Allison will talk a little later about your resume. And so all of these activities have to line up to back up that you actually have prepared to be this major, okay? Now there's some majors where that's a little harder and you have to be creative, but it is critical to being a good candidate at UT. And that's both preparing academically and extracurricularly. So it's both in school and outside of school. So balancing both of those things is really, really important. So one of the things when you are thinking about if you're a rising senior, especially right now, and you're on this call, if you're like, gosh, I thought I wanted to be an engineer, but the truth is I haven't really ever done anything around engineering. Actually, mainly I ran social media for three different groups and um, I'm really, my math score is not so good. Then you need to ask yourself, do I want to be an engineer so bad or do I want to go to UT? And if you want to go to UT, you probably need to at this point think about evaluating all the things you've done and what that fits with and then ask yourself, is that a major that I could be happy in? Those competitive majors that we listed before are not easy to transfer into, okay? So you really don't want to go to a college saying, well, gosh, all major, you know, the big one is everybody thinks if they go to education, number one, education is hard to get into because you've really got to show a lot of education activity. And, and number two, it's hard to switch. So that's a bad strategy. But you need to know your overall goal is, are you so defined on career that if you can't get that top competitive major, you're okay, you're going to go to another college that'll accept you there, right? You need to ask yourself that question before you start kind of mapping out how you're going to put the pieces of this application together. For the students who are on here who are younger, you really, if you have your eyes on UT, need to start exploring major by the 10th grade. I mean, you really do to be able to get the activities on your resume you've, and take the coursework that's going to match up with that, which is young. But, but it is really, really important for this process. Now, some of you may remember if you've had other students go through this process that undergraduate studies used to be an option. And so that was an undecided major, which was fantastic. Unfortunately, what was it, Allison, two years ago? Two years ago, they got rid of that major. So that is not an option. So the, it's just more, I sort of appreciated them doing this though, because I feel like it's just being honest. We are a school that wants you to know your major, period. So you have a couple of options within colleges to go undecided, but you've got to have some focus. So to provide a little bit of context for this, because I think a question that comes up often is like, why are these parameters existing from a university perspective? And so if you're a university and you're trying to manage your student body, some of the things that you care about are things like retention rate. Is my student coming back for a second year? They're concerned about high, their college graduation rate. Are their students finishing on time? And so one of the ways in which they're managing that is making sure that students have taken the time to explore their interests to a much deeper level. So that's part of what's playing into this. The second piece is that um, you have to put caps on uh, majors because some majors are just expensive. Engineering majors are expensive majors. Those labs, those maker spaces, they're not cheap, okay? Like, and they only get so much funding from the state. Remember, we don't like taxes in Texas. So when you're wanting to limit things, that means that that has a tertiary effect on what the schools can do in terms of offering students. So when people were coming in undecided, what ended up happening is people were trying to vie into the most competitive majors rather than truly exploring their interests, which just created a second level of application. So it was easier for them to clean up that process from the get-go as opposed to middle of a, uh, of a student's academic career. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that's it. That's an important thing. And I will also say that UT got a lot of pressure from the legislature on this about seven years ago, I think it was because of just what Claudia said, the graduation rate was not what they wanted it to be. And when they dug into that, they saw that kids were changing their major so much. So that's one of the reasons that they're using that. But it is very much for better, for worse, it's for real. So knowing that is really, really important. The three colleges that do offer an undeclared option is liberal arts. And so that's probably the one that fits an undecided, truly undecided student the most. And usually within all the majors in liberal arts, a student can find some threads of things that maybe they've done or participated in. So that's one that that where you do have that undeclared major. Sciences is also um, has an undeclared major. We haven't had a lot of students utilize that. So I don't have um, a lot of experience with that and then communications also offers an undeclared major so those are the three spots where a student who maybe is a little more broad but has some things to show in that college might want to choose if they were thinking of being a little more on the undecided now one of the things we notice as college consultants working with lots of kids is that people really tend to focus in on about five majors, maybe six or seven. It's business, engineering, pre-med, um, communications, you know, and maybe, you know, architecture or something. So one of the things that I really encourage you to do, UT has the most wonderful website called Wayfinder. And I use it with kids who are looking at UT and kids who aren't, because it's just such a good site. And you can start to explore different majors for interests, okay? So I'm interested in doing marketing. Well, you know what? You could do something other than be a marketing major and still come out prepared for marketing. So these are some of the majors that we think are particularly interesting. Um, the sustainability, the new informatics is a really interesting major. The arts and technology is an interesting major. Um, health and society for those students who are maybe pre-med but want a little more liberal arts in it. And that can be a good strategy for med school too. So there's a lot of really great options outside of those five majors that everybody knows. So before you just say, I definitely want to be a business major, go and look and see the other options because like the Moody School has phenomenal career placement and they're not, they're placing a lot of those kids in industry. So be sure that you're kind of really digging in because Honestly, I mean, the great thing about us having an extra, extra large college in our area is that there's so many options and I'm not even putting on here all the fabulous certificates they have, minor programs, like you can get a business minor with many of these, you can get a sales certificate. So there's a lot of ways to really craft a unique educational experience at UT. But in order for you to do that, you're going to have to, one, kind of just get rid of that mindset that there's only these five majors. And two, you're going to really have to dig in. But I, I encourage you to do it because, it, honestly, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of great stuff. I could go to college six times over with all the time things that they offer. So um, I want to <clears throat> piggyback one thing on uh, Lisa commented. And this is this idea of UT or bust or a focus on a specific major. We oftentimes see students approach this in what they almost feel like is a strategic approach. I'm going to go econ, and then I'm going to uh, uh, transfer into business. First comment, much more difficult than you're expecting. The Combs will always tell you your best shot of getting into our school is as an incoming freshman. Okay, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is I always encourage students to go and look at the curriculum to go and look at what you would be studying for four years. Because if you get in and you can't transfer, you are an econ major. And I love econ. I wish I had been an econ major. But you take radically different classes than you do as a business major. Um, last comment, Lisa mentioned this incredible resource, Wayfinder. I just put the link for it in the chat box. I really urge any students or families that are either A, still trying to decide as a senior, or B, if you're a 9th, 10th, or 11th grader, dive into it. It's a great resource. 
we share it with students, even students who aren't applying to UT. And one last thing I want to say about major, because we didn't really have a slide for it, is if you are in the top 6%, number one, congratulations, that is hard to do. But number two is you, you are guaranteed to admittance into the university. However, you are not guaranteed your major. So you still need to have those fit to major activities. And you, you if you're top 6%, you get three opportunities for majors. And I would say in the last couple of years, we've really seen them try to get students in one of those majors. So that is a plus. For those students who are not in the top 6%, the other thing to understand about the majors is that it's one or done. They look at your top choice, they ask you for two, but really the only students they consider that second one are is for the top 6%. So you have to, this is throwing a dart, you've got to be precise. And so super important to make a lot of good thoughtful decision around that major because a lot there is that, oh, well, I've got two, don't get tricked by that, okay? Quick question that has come through, Lisa has come through a few times. Sure. Um, what about double majoring? You can double major at UT once you get in. You cannot apply to double major, okay? So you're gonna have to choose your kind of first major, if you will, and then when you get in, you can double major. Now, some things would be extra years, right? Like if you were gonna be an engineer and try to double major, you could be there a while. So um, so it, it's really major, but if you were a Spanish and a psychology major, that wouldn't be very hard, do you know what I'm saying? So it, it, are you in the same college or are you going to different college? But they do, the thing I would say that people don't understand about UT majors, there is a lot of flexibility in there once you get in there to mix and match things. And I think because people know, oh, it's really hard to get in Cockrell or McCombs after you get in, they sort of forget that there's, there is a lot available. And honestly, if you're not in a super competitive major, let's say we use Bob's example, you went liberal arts and you did econ and you decided you hated econ and you decided that you wanted to study psychology and that's in the same college, that's pretty easy to do. And even in some of the less competitive colleges, switching from one to the other is, um, is, 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 is sometimes doable. So there is some movement there. We wanted to highlight um, honors programs because I think there's a real opportunity here. Allison, how many honors programs did you tell me UT has? There are 13 honors programs at the University of Texas at Austin. We didn't know this before the website, we're like, before the webinar, we're like, wait, how many are there? So there's, that's a lot of honors programs. We're not gonna talk about all the honors programs. What I wanna say is honors is a smart strategic move with your application if it fits for you because it gets one more reader on your application, okay? So another person could say yes or no to you. So I highly recommend honors programs. There's a few majors where, like I have an art major right now, we couldn't really Really find a good honors program for her. There's a few things where it won't always work, but if you can, um, and Allison is putting in here the UT honors programs in the chat for you guys, I do highly encourage you to look at honors and to consider that. One other question, uh, one other comment about honors. Um, for students, this is a place that you want to dive in and research. You really want to get a sense of it is a, is it an honors program that is deeply and intensely related to my experience at UT, like Plan Two, or is it a place that I have an opportunity to get more engaged in the community, or is it a place that it accelerates part of the curriculum? Do that research so that you understand how does this fit to me. And for some majors, there's multiple. Um, honors programs, which is really cool. So for some majors, you um, like natural sciences, there's three different honors programs depending on your interests. So you really have a lot of opportunity here. And I think what Bob is recommending is so important. It's worth spending the time to research Things and to really get up under the hood here and see all that's available to you because you're, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised how much is available to you there. 
we have a couple of questions that came in about the top 6% and majors. So that's a slightly different, um, whereas a student who is not in the top 6% is read for their first choice major only, a student who is in the top 6% has the opportunity to be read for more than one major, their first choice major, a second choice major, and any honors programs that they might um, apply to. So that is different for the, the students who do end up officially in the top 6% of their schools. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about the expanded resume at UT Austin. This is one of my favorites. Um, the first thing to note is that while we refer to it as a resume and so do they, it actually doesn't look as much like a traditional resume as you might think, mainly in terms of the level and type of detail. So first of all, um, the, the expanded resume at UT does not need to be two pages. And in fact, it could be five pages. I've seen more than five pages sometimes. So what they're really looking for, in addition to the basics of any activity that a student participated in, is in addition, what were any opportunities that the student initiated something? And it could be something small. It could be that they set up the group chat for their team so that everyone could communicate during COVID. It could be that they invited other students to join a club. And in addition, anything the student is exploring, learning, even if there isn't a measured outcome of that, there's, there's a lot of process that's, um, that is also really relevant in an expanded resume. So the goal is um, for students to list every pertinent experience that they've had outside of sitting in a classroom, starting with the summer before ninth grade, all the way until they graduate, meaning that you kind of get to project forward a little bit about, I haven't done this activity yet, but I'm gonna do it my senior year and or I'm gonna keep doing this my senior year, even though senior year, won't, much of it won't have happened by the time you apply to UT, you are allowed to project forward about that. The one area we are not uh, allowed to project forward is awards. So you can't say I'm definitely gonna get that award at the end of the year, but everything else you're allowed to project forward. Um, one thing I wanna add here is that you can, let's say that you want to be an engineer like this sample resume we're showing. If you've taken a bunch of, um, of engineering coursework, you can put classwork in there and I encourage you to for UT because some people may not go do, you know, summer programs or get an internship. Maybe you have to work to help out or whatever. So don't be afraid to use your coursework and mix your coursework with extracurricular stuff. Same is true for business. Like a lot of the schools now have a pretty decent business curriculum or, um, or even like psychology. So if there any place where you took some relevant curriculum to the major you're doing, go ahead and also put that in your resume. Especially, and in those sections, especially if, you did any research or completed a project where you got to choose what the project was about. Um, those are really relevant uh, fit to major activities within a, a classroom environment. A couple of comments here. Um, the first, and for students and parents, this may be helpful. Um, a resume conjures up brevity and formatting. <laughs> Think of this as an inventory of your activities that makes a case for your first choice major. Okay, Involvement is wonderful. And we always say to kids, it's a great starting point. But many of the students who are admitted to competitive majors like computer science or engineering or business or nursing built <clears throat> on that involvement and took initiative. They were so interested in that major that they started things themselves, that they took the extra, extra effort. And in some cases, they actually can point to the impact that they had given that. Good news, UT asked you to write about that impact. 
So the first comment on the major is really to, I mean, on the resume is really to understand it's an inventory of your activities and a case to be made. Um, the second question that several people ask is, um, what about extracurriculars versus should I list my GPA and my test scores on that? Remember, they've seen your transcript. They know your test scores. So the human being that reads this is reading to understand you as a student, not to evaluate you academically. Allison, you've worked on these with so many students. Any other pointers to explain to folks in terms of not necessarily the formatting, but what makes the difference on a resume for a student applying to a competitive major? So in addition to that fit to major, you know, like Bob said, they're reading this resume, this inventory of activities to get a sense of who you are, how you might engage and how you might positively impact your fellow students. So anything and a lot of the things, a lot of the most wonderful things that the students uh, that I have worked with on resumes, a lot of the most wonderful things that they've done aren't things that they really did deliberately. It's just kind of how they do things. And so we really help them think about like, well, okay, so you you went to basketball practice and you did, you know, and you and you went to practice and you played the games and you did all that. What would have been missing in that team if you didn't show up? What do they count on you for? What are things that you do as a member of that team that no one asks you to do? Oh, well, I always set up the group. This is an actual student I had a couple of years ago. I always set up the group chat in whatever um, club I join or group I'm in so that we can all stay connected. And that student didn't think that belonged on his resume because it wasn't, he wasn't doing it for any other reason than he just wanted people to be connected. And yet that can be such an impactful piece of information for an admissions officer trying to build a community of people that need connectors, right? And so a lot of it we call like, okay, so what else? What is the, what would be missing if that student wasn't there? What is something that um, you did that no one asked you to do, especially when it involves um, connecting with, communicating, or mentoring others? Those are a lot of things that students do that, that they kind of do, um, just naturally, and maybe it's not that um, calculated, but that can be a really powerful piece to add to any activity if that's true for the student. And I think what Allison is hitting on that's so important and is really important to UT after fit to major, leadership is really important. So what she's talking about is this wasn't just an athlete, he was being a leader on his team. And so those kinds of things are very, very important. Now, of course, we tell you this resume can be three pages, four pages, make it an appropriate size for the what the student has. So don't get just egregious and just like making one activity a whole page unless it was like something phenomenal. So I mean, the majority of you know really competitive candidates we see have about four to five pages. I've seen some go to seven or eight, uh, and actually one of them I thought, oh, they really needed seven or eight. Um, so, but I wouldn't. It's not by the weight, okay? Like if you're just like putting things in there, um, but non-traditional activities really do count. So it doesn't and. I think defining leadership is really important too, because leadership doesn't just mean I was the president of the student council. It could be, I created that group chat, that's leadership. So it could be informal leadership, mentoring behind the scenes. It also could be um, unconventional, non-traditional activities like, um, you know, I was really bored during COVID and one of our computers broke, so I took it apart to see how it worked. That's cool. Um, and uh, I saw a question come through about well, what if my student does an independent research activity, how do I prove that they did it? First of all, um, anytime you can link photos or, or something like that or, or video, that's great. But otherwise, really, there's an honor system here that if a student is, is working on something that they're curious about and passionate about, the admissions officers take the resume at its at its word and so they're not gonna um they don't need a kind of proof of life of whatever that um whatever that project was but they can definitely tell in the describing of it how involved the student was right because 
because a student who did a pro an independent project at home um, probably has lots to talk about, about why they did it and how they did it and what worked and what didn't. And so I really feel like, you know, the activities themselves tell the story. It could be things that you do with the youth group at your church. It could be things that you do independently. It could be common good activities, service work. We tell our students, if you're asking yourself the question, does this count? It does. Put it on there. Right. If it was something that you did that you enjoyed, that you learned from or something that you did that you didn't enjoy, that you learned from, sometimes those are really those are some of the best learning opportunities. Also, family responsibilities, things that you needed to do in order, especially during the pandemic, but outside of the pandemic, too. Um, a lot of students have really valid, really important family responsibilities that might keep them from being able to do as many outside of school extracurriculars. Those absolutely belong not only on this resume, but when we get to talking about essays, there's a, an essay, an optional essay that's especially directed at any extenuating circumstances that might have either impacted your grades or your level of involvement. And so that's a place for that story as well. I hope everybody sees the importance of fit to major and resume. We're now going to turn our attention to essays. One last comment, though, on resume. Understand you're not applying for a graphic design major. How you format your resume, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. We're certainly not going to tell you don't spend the time, but they're not going to evaluate you on that. They're going to evaluate you on the involvement you have, the initiative you took, and the impact you had. They're going to evaluate you as an applicant, particularly related to that first choice major. And one last thing on that is that the currency in activities is the hours that you spend. So on a resume, as you'll see on this, if you can see it in the slide, it's like 36 hours a week um, for one week a year. So uh, students, this is important because you don't want your resume full of one hour a week activities as you go on. You want to have things that you're spending a good bit of time on. So just understanding that hours are the currency in resumes is really, really important. And that's a great point, Lisa, because a lot of students have been trained to think about hours in terms of service hours. Like the only thing that counts when you do, uh, when the only thing sometimes that students that schools count in service is the actual hours you spent doing the activity. Resume hours are not that. So anything, anytime you spent, you're a lacrosse player and you traveled to a tournament and then you sat and waited while it was your turn to play. And then you sat and waited while it was your turn to play again. All of that time counts. And so it's kind of opposite of service hours. Anytime you spent, um, uh, practicing independently for an instrument that you also play in the band counts. Anytime you spent sending emails to, you know, a uh, fellow uh, LLS fundraising team, like all of that counts. And so um, I think that is important to think about as well. And now uh, one of the, the other ways um, that students get to share what they've done is to talk about essays. So in the essay process at UT Austin, um, you have a lot of real estate. You have a lot of opportunity to not just um, answer questions, but to tell your story. And I am a super nerd about college essays. And I'm a, the superest nerd about um, UT essays because I like to think that they, fit, they, they have the opportunity to really fit together like a puzzle where the personal statement shows us one thing about you, but then the major essay shows us this other side of you and the other side of you. And so um, one of the things that is important to think about in the essays is that they're not the resume. They see your resume. You've spent your time on that beautiful, descriptive, narrative as, uh, resume, and now, the essays that you write are the opportunity to go deeper than, than just the doing. And I like to explain to my essay students that the resume and the transcript and all of the other data that goes to an admissions officer helps them finish the sentence, uh, Bob can. But the essays help them finish the sentence, Bob is someone who. 
And that's what they're using to build community. Bob is someone who um, goes out of his way to make sure people feel connected. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of questions that came through about the personal statement. The personal statement is that quote unquote college essay that you hear about in the media that you might hear your friends to or seniors talk about. Um, uh, despite the hype, it's a relatively simple genre. Um, and it's, we call it the long essay because it's the longest essay in the admissions process, but it's really between 500 and 700 words, which for most high school students, isn't that long. It's like a typed page and then that much. Um, <laughs> and while there is a, a, an essay prompt, um, the point of the essay is really to show the admissions team something about you that is not visible or, or visible in any depth in the other pieces of the application. So for example, um, uh, again, it's that someone who you might, you might be uh, the uh, person who spends all of their time in band, right? The essay doesn't need to talk about all the things you did in band, but it might talk about that moment where you met someone who was gonna quit band and you helped them figure out a way to continue their commitment. It could be a story that has nothing to do with school and just about something about you, um, an experience that you've had in your life where you, where you entered the experience one version of yourself and left the experience another version of yourself. When I work with my essay students, we call that arc of growth, shift in uh, perspective. Um, we call that the deal breaker. So there are a lot of beautiful stories out there, but if we don't see growth in the student, it's not the most effective um, story to tell. The, I like to think too, that the best personal statement actually makes the resume come to life even more. And so you look at that resume and you think, whoa, look at all the things that this human did. You might, because you are a human reading it, you might make some assumptions about the person behind all those activities. The personal statement is the opportunity to show what's really underneath those activities. My favorite story is a few years ago, I worked with a student who had played every sport for one year. So when I read, I helped her with her resume and I read her resume, one could have interpreted that as, oh, that's someone who doesn't stick with things very long, right? That's someone who, who can't, like, can't find her way. As it turned out, the story underneath those activities was that she's an engineer and she liked to put her body in different systems to test the limits. And so her personal statement was all about limit testing and how she liked to see what, what uh, tennis brought out in her versus what volleyball brought out in her. And that was that made that whole resume come to life. Um, it does not need to be what we call a neon moment. Some of the best college essays, I, like I, as, as all everyone in our team, we all have favorites, but some of the best college essays have been about simple moments like power washing or lawn mowing or barbecuing with your grandfather or learning to crochet. One of my favorites is uh, being really bad at learning to crochet, right? Like I, there was a student I worked with a couple of years ago during the early pandemic whose essay was all about the number of times she tried to learn how to crochet during the pandemic. Um, and it was a great, it was a great uh, reflection of who she was as a person, as someone who just couldn't leave the challenge, like it had to keep going back. Um, does not need to be, um, uh, a traumatic event at all. Um, and in fact, should just be a story that you have to tell that helps us see something essential about you. Something that if we spent 30 minutes with you, like you might in a college interview, that we would understand this thing about you. Anybody else want to add? To Claudia, as somebody who's read a lot of these essays, what, what do you love in a great college essay? 
Um, so two things. One, I want to go back to Allison's like question, like finale there. And you do not have to relive trauma if trauma is part of your life to make it part of your college essay. Do not wish for your grandma to die so that you have tragedy to talk about. That's the worst. I've seen people say that in admissions office. I'm like, what are you saying? What are you saying, people? Um, so the, really the best essays are just essays that are genuine to you, that are just talking about who you you are as a person. And I know that that can be really hard to understand, but I think a lot of it is because as a student, you need to put in the work to reflect and to think about what makes you you. So I have read phenomenal essays about things as mundane as washing glassware like beakers and graduated cylinders because they were a TA for their chem class. I've read phenomenal essays about the color blue um, and what blue means to them. Um, I'm partial to food essays because <laughs> if you've not been on a webinar with us before, food is a big part of who I am. Um, <laughs> and in admissions, people like to eat. So just so you know, FYI, like that's always a good one to go to. But there are so many wonderful, rich places to come from where they're just really looking for some perspective into your life. The challenge is, is that do not feel pressured to write your entire life story in 650 words. Okay, that's not the goal of the essay. The goal of the essay is share a moment. Awesome. That, um, one of the things that with that is that don't be afraid to be a little vulnerable, to show yeah. a little of yourself. I think one of the things that we hear the adults in students' lives say sometimes is, oh, don't talk about the time you, something messed up or a mistake or something less than. And sometimes those are such beautiful essays. Like no one's expecting you to be perfect. You're 17 years old. So really let it be a 17 year old's essay and parents, I, I had really encourage you to let this be your students because student voice is so obvious. And, you know, today I read an essay and I was like, no student would ever say that. And so I know we all want to help our kids. I'm a parent. I totally understand that. But honestly, there's a, even when it's a little clunky, there's something endearing about a 17 year old voice in an essay that when someone goes in and just tidies it too much. It's it doesn't have the same heart or grab that it had when it was really truly just the students' vulnerable words. Right, and I'm going to really emphasize that to parents: keep your hands off your students' essays. I'm just going to be really direct about it because I've read thousands of essays throughout the course of my career, and nothing is worse than seeing a parent write poorly. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that you can immediately identify when a parent writes because it does not sound like a 17 year old. Listen, it's okay. We're middle aged or older. Okay. It's okay. And I can tell you that my voice now in this point in my life is very different from my 17 year old self. And that's why admissions people can sniff out those essays pretty readily. So trust your student. They're going through the process. They're going through their growing moment. And so if you don't let them work on this essay, you've robbed them of this opportunity to learn about themselves. Excellent. Um, in addition to that personal statement that gets a lot of um, attention, there are, um, there are short answer supplemental questions. So there are, this year, there are three supplemental uh, essays for UT and each one has kind of a different, uh, a different role, a uh, different topic. Uh, and the opportunity there is to really figure out how they complement each other. So if your personal statement is all about um, what you learned uh, growing up as the youngest sibling and how patient and um, observant you became as a result, then the other essays don't need to touch that right? The other, and in fact, the other essays might touch something really different, right? Like your, your passion for, you know, murals or, um, or uh, other unique things about you. Again, the supplemental, the supplemental essay questions 
are also not designed to regurgitate your resume. That resume has its own space. Um, and so uh, put all those details there. And then in the supplemental essays, you have the opportunity um, to make it easy for the admissions officers to get the information they are asking for. If they say, how did you make a positive impact through an activity, find an activity, describe it specifically, and show how you made a positive impact. So there's no trick. Um, they really, they really want to know. And these, I think, are much, while they're dense essays, I think genre-wise, they're much more similar to what students write for school all the time. And so really, the first job is answer the question. Read the question, answer the question. If it's a multi-part question, and put those pieces. Um, break up those pieces and answer each of the questions to make sure you've answered it and then jam that into some paragraphs. Um, the rule in college essays is specific over general. So for example, during high school, I led in a lot of different ways versus when I was asked to represent my class for student council, I really learned how to listen. Those are two very, both of those could have been an answer to the leadership question, but the second one absolutely grabs the reader. Remember, these folks are reading lots of applications. So giving them specific details where you and you and your story come alive really do you and them a favor. Um, when they ask about the major that you've indicated as your first choice major, this is really that make a case essay. You want to state that major at the beginning. They don't know. Don't, don't bury the lead of the major at the end of the essay. I'm excited about being an engineer. Awesome. Now we know your major. And now you have the opportunity to say, and here's what I've done to explore that uh, during high school. Um, again, specific. When I did this summer program, here's what I realized. When I worked at this job and the, uh, the drive through window broke. Here's what I learned about engineering. So um, again, specific over general. In addition, a really good supplemental essay also shows the reader how you're going to contribute to the community at that school. So for your major essay, how are you going to get engaged at UT related to that major? What is it going to look like in the classroom when you, how is that going to positively impact your fellow students and the academic environment that they're in? Um, and the, uh, the second one is, is not necessarily about leadership. It's really about tell us an experience, perspective, or talent that you have and show us how that looked at some point in high school. And then how is that thing about you going to make an impact in and out of the classroom at UT? I've had students write about um, being really shy and how that particular experience makes them really aware of other people who are sitting at the back of the class. And so they connect with people and they on purpose have learned to ask questions so that other people feel comfortable asking, right? So it doesn't have to be, again, I was president of the student council, okay? Um, but it should be uh, an experience that was meaningful to you where you um, made a positive impact and then you parallel that and say, project yourself to UT. Well, at UT, here's this, this um, uh, student engagement group that I definitely want to be a part of. And you know what? I want to be a peer mentor so that any freshman coming in who feels shy, I'll absolutely understand and I'll be able to connect with them, right? Um, and then the third essay, which is my um, all-time favorite, is how you believe the experience at UT will prepare you to change the world after you graduate. No pressure. Um, <laughs> uh, and actually no pressure because it's really, what's something that's important to you? It could be as big as one person, as big as um, uh, an entire global issue. We've had students write about climate change. I've also had students write about um, uh, their family responsibilities and how they want to make um, want to make more space for folks who have family responsibilities to make their way through college. So it, do, again, doesn't have to be a neon moment, but it should be a way for the reader to see that you're connected and aware of something way bigger than you. So an issue um, 
uh, that's bigger than just um, you or your high school. Um, and then what resources at this amazing top tier university are you gonna identify that can help you develop the skills to address um, and navigate and advocate potentially for that issue? So part of this essay is a research project uh, in the UT website about, wait, I'm really passionate about climate change. Let me see what professors in the College of Geosciences are researching alternative energies. Wow, maybe I could do some research with one of those. In fact, wow, there's Dr. So-and-so who's researching this very thing that I've been curious about. Maybe I could do some research with him. And so it's really showing them how you see the resources at UT and that you've already identified at least three that are, that you are going to engage with so that they know that not only you're gonna maximize your own experience, but in doing that, you're gonna impact the people around you, right? And I always tell my students, never forget that the other resource at UT is the 34,000 Longhorns that are there with you, right? <laughs> that is a great, if you can say like this thing, I've always been passionate about, I'm gonna make sure a lot of people get involved in this thing especially for students who are based in Austin. I've seen some really compelling essays about, I did this work with this particular issue in Austin while I was in high school. I can't wait to get more people involved with this specific organization, my fellow Longhorns at UT, and actually support this uh, organization even further. So there's lots of ways to go with this. Again, specific over general, and do your homework in that UT website. And I would add the most important writing that you will do for UT is question one, your major. It is the most important piece of writing that you need to make sure you have well polished, okay? All of the writing is important, but because this whole application, the story of you in this case is also a case for a major, you want to hit that one home and you want to, you want to really spend some time there. The other thing is you're going to be asked that by many, many colleges. So when you do a nice job on that, you're going to have it ready for other colleges as well. Okay. Uh, a comment on timing for everyone. There have been so many questions. It's fabulous. We are going to run five minutes over. Okay, so um, we are recording this. We'll share it as a follow up, but we just wanted to manage expectations. We are going to run five minutes over because there are just so many great questions. Um, Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about applications? Um, sure. Okay, so a big change this year is that the that UT has gone to the common application. Claudia, do you want to kind of give a little background of that, what that shift is going to, how that shift helps students? So one, it helps students tremendously because the common application is a very easy platform. It's very intuitive. So it's not uh, very difficult to do. It also auto saves, which who doesn't love a feature that auto saves, right? So um, the other platform we used previously, which shall not be named because it's one of those <laughs> kinds of things, um, was not the best platform to use. So yay for this move for UT. Now on the not so great side is what has traditionally happened with colleges and universities who join the common application is that they experience an increase in applications. So so we will see what happens with UT and whether or not they continue to follow the trend of all the other universities who have joined the Common App, but I would suspect that we're going to see an increase in applications to the university. Totally agree. And then one final thing that's really important is that UT is a two-step um, process. You submit your application to the university. You then receive a login to what's called My Status. If you don't put anything down today and you're about to apply, this is really important. If you don't go to my status, that you're going to be missing out on a lot because my status is where you upload your resume. My status is where you apply to honors. My status is really important, okay? So don't forget that step because it's a critical part. It's a little bit confusing um, is because not all colleges certainly don't do that. So remember, you're going to submit that common app. 
you're going to get an email and then you're going to upload my status. One other little user tip for those of you who stayed on. That means that you don't want to submit on right before it's due because you won't have time to get your items in on time. Do you see what I'm, because there's a little bit of a lag between when you submit and when you get that email. So be sure that you are giving yourself like three days or so, so that you can get that. And then you can get all your things uploaded. So let's say you're going for that priority deadline of November 1st, that you actually have your items in. So that's really, really important. Um, in terms of timeline, I think we've talked a lot here. There have been questions. Generally speaking, we're a fan of students submitting their application when their application is done aged or vintage applications, students, they don't improve. When you have <laughs> great don't. personal statements and supplements and your resume is ready, hit submit. The second piece of advice on timeline, watch your email box for your email from your high school counselor. Because every high school has their own approach to transcripts and letters of rec. And you need to know it and follow it because those folks have tough jobs when school comes back. And you want to make sure you're working with them in the process and approach that they have. Um, there have just been so many great questions. I, I show this slide to honestly say if there are any last remaining questions that folks have been sitting on, please share them in the Q&A box. Um, we'll stay on for a couple more minutes to try to finish out any of those questions. And then again, we will be sharing the recording of this, this presentation itself and our guide in a follow-up note. But are there any other questions that folks are um, asking that I folks have been saying? that I think, think is important that um, I'm gonna let Claudia answer since she's been in admissions. And that is, is it better to use one platform other than the <clears throat> one over the other. Now we prefer the Common App because it's much easier than Apply Texas and it allows you then to apply to all your other colleges. But Claudia, would you would you address is one application better than the other? So it's really just better for you because from a college or university perspective, they don't care whether you use uh, apply Texas, whether you use the common application. Um, if you're applying to other colleges or universities, they might use something called coalition. There's so many different app platforms. They don't really care so long as it's a, an approved platform for their school. Right. Exactly. So I know there's a lot of rumor running around that, oh, you've got to use the apply Texas. You've got, and honestly, UT was using coalition for a long time and we had students use coalitions. I don't see any <clears throat> Is there and because they asked for that long resume you've got plenty of of bandwidth to show your activities and everything the other question that i saw that i think is worth um is when to apply if you're not in the top six percent i don't think that timing is incredibly crucial with ut like a m is a rolling school so it is crucial i think the november deadline is great most of our students tend to apply to UT in September because it's we always do UT and A&M first before we do the rest of the colleges. And so if it's done, I would go on and submit it. I mean, don't, don't sit on your application, but make sure you have a strong application. So now I know there are those people that are rushing around to get it in this week because they believe that's going to make a difference. I don't have any evidence of that being true in the last, you know, five years. So um, anyway, I would, I think, I think September, October is a nice time to submit. If you're ready sooner, you can certainly apply sooner. The other question that came through was, does the top 6% apply to out-of-state students? No, great question. The top 6% does not apply to out-of-state students, only in-state students. And, um, you know, we are, as Bob said, capped here in the state of Texas. In addition, top students in Texas, if they don't get in, will get a cap offer. In other words, an offer to go to another campus and come to UT the following year. Students out-of-state do not get that offer. So there is some difference with the out-of-state. Um, Lisa, a last question, and then we're going to wrap up. 
and this is a question for the team, um, should a student wait on submitting her application until she knows her letter of rec is in, uh, until her transcript in? Do they need to sit on their components of the application or how do the test scores and transcript and letters of rec come in if they submit their application before those are submitted? So they those items need to all be in by the due date, okay? So you could submit it earlier with one, one place I would be careful. If you're still testing and you don't know if you wanna go test optional or not, I would wait because you have to make that decision. And then you're, so that's the one place I would hold off is if you're still testing and you're really think you're going to do something great, I would hold off until you have that test score to make that decision. Another interesting question just came in, which is, is there a, a priority about where, whether application from Austin versus Pflugerville versus Leander versus Cedar Park, does that make an impact at all? No, the UT uses tons of readers, right? So they hire part, you know, readers for the season. Those people are from all over. So no, that doesn't matter at all. We thank you guys for all these wonderful questions. You've been a wonderful, wonderful audience, super engaged. Thank you so much. We will be sending out, as Bob said, the um, the this presentation and the recording so that if you didn't catch something, you'll get it. And we just thank you for spending the evening with us. We thoroughly enjoyed it.